All rise. Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. The Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the state of Texas, this Honorable Court. Thank you, be seated please. Well, welcome to this very special occasion of the Supreme Court of Texas. This marks the first time I'm told that the court has met formally in this historic room for more than 53 years since the Supreme Court building was finished in 1959. And for those among us who are not of the internet age, this is also the first time a court proceeding has been webcast from this room. Now we are all uh, here at the bench and in the courtroom products of history. The 1959 court would be surprised about the internet. They would marvel, I think, at the court's diversity. They would wonder why their colleague Nathan Heck is still on the bench. <laughs> we are... <laughs> but we are here to receive, as a court, the first book about our history since 1917. And for that, we are grateful to Jim Haley, the author. And I thought we'd give him a round of applause right now. We thank, of course, the Texas Supreme Court Historical Society, which has worked diligently on this project for years to publish this impressive history, and to its director, Bill, Bill Pugsley, and thank you, Bill, wherever you are for making this happen. The Historical Society was the brainchild of Justice Jack Hightower and Dr. Lynn Phillips. Is Lynn here today? Uh, they were instrumental, of course, and Lynn's husband is rumored to be fond of history himself, but we're here today because Lynn and Jack had a conversation who is accumulating the stories that define an institution that, with the Republican statehood, stood guard over the rule of law, our professor, our society, and our predecessors. Their conversation, Lynn and Jack's, in 1990, ended in the incorporation of the society. And a document signed by former Chief Justices Robert Calvert, Joe Greenhill, and Jack Pope. 300 members later, the society has now given us a tangible and academic treatment of the court, its great successes, and its influential place in the life of the Texas that we all love. Your vision will ensure and enrich the understanding of future generations who will find in Jim Haley's work not just biographical sketches, uh, the principal feature of the 1917 book, but this one will give judicial philosophies that shape the law of Texas and landmarks in the law, landmarks like slavery and women's rights and water law, prohibition and consumer protection and many, many others. This book's history uh, ends in 1986 and in historical terms, the years since are current events. We trust, Jim, that you and the society are already at work on the next volume. I am sure that we are all interested in how this piece of nonfiction came to be. And for that, it is my pleasure to introduce the current president of the society, a partner in the firm, Bracewell Giuliani, Wainwright and Hutchison, uh, <laughs> Warren Harris, Warren. Mr. Chief Justice, distinguished guest, may it please the court. This is a great day in the history of the Texas Supreme Court. We're very pleased that the court has convened a special session to receive the first book published on its history in nearly a century, The Texas Supreme Court, A Narrative History, 1836 to 1986 by James L. Haley. 
and there's no more appropriate place for the court to hold this ceremony than here in this courtroom. The court met in this courtroom from, eight, from 1888 to 1959, and fully half of the events that are written about in this book took place while the court was sitting in this courtroom. One notable event in this court's history took, that took place in this courtroom was in 1925, when Governor Neff appointed a special all-woman Supreme Court, the first all-woman Supreme Court in the nation to hear an appeal evolving the Woodman of the World Fraternal Association. And we're pleased that a descendant of one of those justices is with us today. Linda Hunziker is the great-granddaughter of Chief Justice Hortense Sparks Ward. Thank you for being with us today, Linda. As the Chief mentioned, the court has not convened in this courtroom since 1959, that is until today. We're pleased that it is this occasion that brings the court back to this historic courtroom. And we would like to expend, extend a special thanks to John Sneed and the State Preservation Board for making this beautiful and historic room available to us for the ceremony today. The Texas Supreme Court Historical Society is proud to sponsor this new book on the court's history. The society is dedicated to preserving the history of this court. Under the leadership of last year's President Lynn Liberato and her predecessors, the society today is more active than ever and has an outstanding board of trustees. Many of you may be familiar with some of our events, like our annual Hemp Hill Dinner, named for Chief Justice John Hemp Hill. But many of you aren't familiar with other projects of the society, such as our quarterly journal and our upcoming symposium on the history of Texas Supreme Court jurisprudence. None is more fundamental to our mission than the Society's Texas Legal Studies series. This series of books was started by Justice Craig Enoch, a former president of the Society, and this new book is the capstone on that series. We wanted a book that would capture the attention of everyone, from appellate lawyers to history buffs, from middle school teachers to law professors, to the general public here and beyond the great state of Texas. And Jim Haley has accomplished this. This is not a history of the law, but a history of the court and of the men and women who have ascended to it. As Jim Haley aptly put in the book's preface, this is a fascinating story populated by fascinating people. And the goal is to give general readers an, an appreciation of their unique judicial heritage. I hope that by the holidays you will see a copy of this book on the shelf of every lawyer's office across the state. But if that is all that happens, our, our goal will not have been fulfilled. The mission of the society is to spread this story to classrooms and libraries across the state so that students and the public can learn of the rich history of our Texas Supreme Court. The path to publication of this history is a long one. I could spend an hour telling you all the interesting details about how this book came about, but I can spare you those today because our executive director, Bill Pugsley, has done a wonderful job of telling this story in the preface to the book. When you get a copy of the book, please do read that story. But how did this wonderful idea about showcasing the rich history of our court become a reality? One person is at the center of all of it, and that person is Larry McNeil. Simply put, without Larry's leadership, we would not be here today to present the court its history. Larry McNeil was president of the society, and he realized for this book to become a reality, the society had to raise money, more than it had ever raised, in order to find a, an appropriate author to write this history. We are fortunate that we were able to retain an award-winning author like Jim Haley, and you'll hear more about Jim momentarily. But when it came for fundraising for this book, Larry knew where to go, and that was to Harry Reasoner. Harry immediately agreed to contribute to this project and to also get others to do so. The first person Harry called was Joe Jamel, and what a duo those two are to get a project off the ground. Harry continued to contact lawyers and firms and ask them to contribute to the book. And we all know how this story turned out because no one can say no to Harry Reasoner. Thank you to all, to all three of you for making this book become a reality. And there are several others that also need our thanks for their contributions to this book. Marilyn Duncan served as consulting editor for the book. As Jim Haley points out, he's worked with some good editors, but never one who, contained the, who had the editorial eye and instinct 
and combine that with Maryland's efficiency of finding key materials. He asked Maryland to be a co-author of the book, but if you know Maryland, you knew that she would decline that invitation. And finally, we couldn't have done this without the support of the many donors to the book. In addition to Vincent and Elkins and Joe Jamel, our top donors were Baker and Botts, Bracewell and Giuliani, Fulbright and Jaworski, Haynes and Boone, and the Summerlee Foundation. All of our donors are listed in the book, and we thank each of them for their contributions, large and small. On behalf of society, we hope all of you enjoy reading the history of the Supreme Court of Texas. You have heard a wonderful introduction of the person without whom this project would not have succeeded. It is my great pleasure and honor now to introduce uh, Larry McNeil, who will introduce the author. Mr. McNeil. Mr. Chief Justice, distinguished guest, may it please the court. When Bill Pugsley called me with the news that author James Haley was available, I knew the society had finally turned the corner on its long-standing goal of producing a court history. We'd struggled with the concept of multiple writers for a long period of time, and had finally determined having only one author made more sense, and the opportunity to have someone of Jim's caliber as the one and only writer told me we'd made a great decision in changing the original approach. I remember visiting Judge Will Garwood in his chambers and seeing his delight when I told him about Jim. This was particularly gratifying considering the judge's sometimes strong expressions of frustration at board meetings on the subject of the book's progress. Jim Haley was raised in Fort Worth, graduated from the University of Texas at Arlington summa cum laude, and was well into his second year at the University of Texas School of Law when he realized his calling was not as an attorney. And for this, I am very thankful, since we have plenty of good lawyers, but nowhere near enough good authors. I enjoy reading books on Texas history, and my knowledge of Jim Haley and his capabilities as a writer come from reading five of his books. The first two, Texas, an album of history from the frontier to Spindletop, and Texas from Spindletop through World War II, presented unusual perspectives of Texas eras using a great deal of photographs, maps, and primary sources. The third book I read, The Buffalo War, The History of the Red River Indian Uprising of 1874, was actually Jim's first book, published way back in 1976. And I found the fluidity of his writing style highly unusual for a subject matter normally couched in the dry prose unfortunately practiced by too many academic historians, and for that matter, too many academic writers in general. And then I came across Jim's book on Sam Houston, which I found difficult to put down. He presented a plausible explanation of Houston's perplexing career and character, and he did so in a very readable way. As stated in a review appearing in the Western Historical Quarterly, quote, one of those all too rare books that managed to bridge the great divide that separates scholars and the history reading general public, lively and invigorating. Haley's book on Houston was truly a page turner for me. The support for his various propositions about Houston, such as the inaccuracy of previous characterizations of Sam's first marriage, or his real strategy behind the runaway scrape were so heavily footnoted that I was turning from my place in the book to the back of the book on almost every page, on top of which, the footnotes themselves were independently fascinating reads. My opinion as to the high quality of the Sam Houston biography is certainly not unusual. Jim received numerous awards for this work, including the Western Writers of America Treasured Spur, Spur Award as Best Biography, the Texas State Historical Association's Prize for Best Book of 2002, and the T.R. Fehrenbach Award of the Texas Historical Commission, which honors, quote, the person that has provided a significant contribution to the promotion and preservation of the history of the state of Texas. The remaining book I've read is Passionate Nation, The Epic History of Texas. You know, it doesn't seem right to describe a 650-page book as a compendium. 
that is a brief treatment or account of a subject, but I think that fairly describes it, and I suspect Jim had enough material to make it a multi-volume work. So these books were my introduction to Jim Haley, and the reason for my enthusiasm when I learned he was available to write the Supreme Court history. As I explained at the time to my fellow board members, we wanted a recognized writer, at least in part a Texas historian, who took the scholarship of this undertaking seriously, but whose writings were so readable that the court's history would appeal not just to attorneys, judges, and legal historians, but also to the general reading public. We wanted someone with prior experience writing a narrative history because we considered that approach the best way to present so many years of the court's history, 150 to be exact. We wanted someone who could put the history of our Supreme Court in context with the history of our state. We have these for our executive department and to a lesser extent our legislators, but nothing at all for the judiciary. Herbert Davenport's 1917 history of the Supreme Court is the only history we have till now and it provides very little in this regard. We did not want someone who would write a book that was only about the evolution of various kinds of Texas law, such as tort law, contract law, or constitutional law. As many in this room know, law professors have written more of these than you can shake a stick at, all of which report cases decided by our Supreme Court but never give any life to the court itself. Finally, we wanted someone who could overcome a common perception that an appellate court, even the highest court in the state, would lack for interesting stories. That assessment is, of course, totally incorrect. What the society needed was a master storyteller, someone who could weave everything into a coherent narrative that would both educate and entertain. And from what I read of his work, I had no doubt Jim Haley met all of these criteria. So I was very happy when Jim agreed to write the book that brings us all here today, and I'm very happy to introduce to you now author of Texas Supreme Court, A Narrative History, James L. Haley. No pressure. When I left law school in 1978, decided I would rather write books, these are words that I, would, I thought I would never in my life hear myself say, but Mr. Chief Justice, honorable members of the court, <laughs> may it please the court. Uh, I was last in this room about six weeks ago in my uh, previous guise as a tour guide. I worked for the State Preservation Board, and when nobody was looking, I stepped over the velvet rope, uh, just kind of scope out the room so I wouldn't be totally overwhelmed by the occasion but I didn't know at that point that I would be facing the sitting court, uh, past court members, judges, so many distinguished people. Uh, and so, yeah, a shy little writer is just a little bit um, overwhelmed. I have a few of my own really heartfelt thanks uh, to pass around. Um, first, to the State Preservation Board for making this wonderful room available. Uh, the tour guide in me has got to tell you that uh, between the Supreme Court room and the governor's public reception room, those are easily the two best restoration jobs from when they uh, reworked the Capitol in the 1980s. They actually found swatches of the original carpet, which they rewove. And in fact, you may not know this. I'm going to be pointing to some of the pictures around. Um, top row of the pictures, second from the right in the ornate frame, is Reuben Reed Gaines. He was Chief Justice from 1894 to 1911. When he was an associate judge, he came to the carpet and he stopped and he wouldn't walk on this carpet in his street shoes. He made the, uh, Alex the Porter bring him carpet slippers which may be one reason why, you know, some of it was still preserved. Uh, the gold, gold uh, brocatel drapes, they had fragments of those. Those were rewoven. The walnut curtain rod is original. And, of course, the, the bench is original. By the way, one little um, uh, get ahead of my story here uh, um, factoid that I like to tell the tourists. The motto on the bench, Sicud patribus si deus nobis. Um, a lot of us are unaware that that actually, for many years, was the motto of the city of Boston. Uh, and for many, many years, it has been translated as, <clears throat> as he was to our fathers, so may God be to us. Well, in 1902, they hired uh, a clerk who had actually taken some Latin. <laughs> and Latin, of course, being a wonderfully ambiguous language to try and translate in any event, said, no, 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 sicut patribus sit deus nobis, as our fathers did, God will do to us. <laughs> <laughs> Different narrative. So, um, Thanks to the Preservation Board for making this wonderful room uh, available. And the people I worked with, Bill, 
Pugsley, the uh, director of the society, uh, boy, he kept the, the engine going. Uh, Marilyn that I, I worked with, I tell you what, I have worked with some of the best editors in the business and I've never, oh my goodness, um, she is, is the most amazing uh, person to work with. Larry McNeil, who became the patron saint of the book. The donors, I mean, I tell you what, um, books don't happen out of thin, I mean, we all know how the publishing industry is, change, is changing. Uh, remember things called bookstores? Uh, remember publishing houses? And now it's all about you know, uh, kindling and, and blogging and publish your own, own on the internet. Uh, books like this don't happen without some backing. And when, I tell you what, when Bill came up to me at a TSHA meeting and kind of pretty literally buttonholed me and said, I want to talk to you, and he told me about this, I thought, that's why I went to law school. This was planned out from a long time ago. And you know, I, I tell you what, that I suspect that, well, yes, it's true I wrote the book, but in this whole process, I probably had the least burden to carry, because I tell you, when we got all through with it and the book had its scholarly readings and it was accepted, and uh, Bill and Marilyn and Larry and I were in a meeting over at UT Press about how to do the book and all this, and I said, well, that was fun. Why don't we do another one? <laughs> well, I figured out right away they probably needed a rest. So uh, I'm going to talk for just a few minutes about if these walls could talk. I mean, if these pictures could speak, wouldn't they have interesting things to say? And I tell you what, uh, I have heard that on occasion um, they have had interesting things to say. Uh, when this court still met in this room, uh, Alex Phillips, who had been the porter for decades and decades, uh, was found alone in here one night, just sitting with his own thoughts. And clerk Carl Lida came in, he often worked at night, and he came in and turned on the light and said, well, Alex, what are you doing sitting in here? And he said, well, I was just visiting with Judge Gaines and Judge Brown. <coughs> they left and you opened the door. <laughs> I want you to know, I don't doubt that for a minute. You know, there's so many things that make Texas jurisprudence unique. I mean, I've, I've done Texas history for almost 40 years. I mean, I, I'm in love with Texas history still. But come to find that the judiciary and what the court, how it interplayed with the Texas society is every bit as unique. One of the most, and I'm just going to point to some paintings around here. Uh, the guy here on the left, uh, under the gold brocatel, Abner Lipscomb. Now, he was no, no uh, newbie when it came to the law. He'd been on the, the Supreme Court of Alabama for 12 years. Well, when he came out here, he discovered one of the unique things about Texas is it's where the Old South met the Old West. So it's the only place in the United States where the cotton planters are having to keep an eye out for Indian attacks. And so you had these odd situations, and he was always having to come up with, with new uh, ways to uh, craft their decisions, split some hairs, because uh, the frontier had different expectations than the more settled regions of the country. Uh, for instance, well, back in those days, of course, the Supreme Court had criminal jurisdiction, and that's covered in the book, uh, including one case. There was a murderer in 1854 appealed his case to the Supreme Court solely on the grounds of, well, I had more witnesses than the prosecution. And there's this elegantly worded opinion by uh, Justice Lipscomb saying, well, it's not really going to work that way. Uh, it's not going to matter how many witnesses you have. It's what did they say and how credible are they? He did overturn that decision, however. Uh, he said it was reversible error for the clerk to have been giving whiskey to the jury <laughs> while they were deliberating. Uh, and he said, since we can't know from one individual to another how much is going to incapacitate his, ju his judgment, it's just best not to, to be given whiskey to the jury. And for his um, authority, he cited um, Sir Walter Scott and bold John Barleycorn, which is probably the only time that B John Barleycorn has been cited as an authority. Um, the guy in the middle, John Hemphill. Now, today he's known as the John Marshall of Texas, longtime Chief Justice. He bridged the court from the Republic uh, into the state of Texas. And he is the guy who had the smarts to recognize that Texas had a unique identity quite apart from the United States or the English common law. Uh, and you know, in 1840, the Texas Congress passed a statute. There's a lot of anti-Mexican feeling. We just had the revolution. Uh, we're all want to be Americans now. And so you're going to start using the English common law as it comes to us through the United States as the basis of your decision. Well, Judge Hemphill, uh, being an expert in Spanish law, said, no, well, isn't that stupid? And so he is the reason why, uh, for instance, under Spanish law, uh, women in New Spain, in Mexico, in uh, the Republic of Texas, women could own property. They could go into business. 
They came out of marriage with uh, community property. It's unthinkable in the United States. And thanks to Hemp Hill, we kept that. Uh, the law of debtor and creditor, and a lot of this, by the way, goes straight back to a woman who should be on the wall in here, and she's not. That's Queen Isabella of Castile. In uh, 1498, she and her husband, who, by the way, um, when they got married, she did not take a crown matrimonial. Uh, uh, manto tante tante manto. Uh, equal power, equal station, equal dignity. And so she did not take the matrimonial crown. In fact, she uh, squeezed a prenup from him, one of history's very first. They passed a decree in 1498 that said, well, if you're in debt, you need to pay it, but they can't come and take away everything you got. Well, in the United States and Great Britain, they had debtor's prisons. And so we had, there were select areas of the law in which Texas was light years ahead of the rest of the country uh, in points of law that have never really been appreciated. In fact, um, uh, when the feminists all got together at Seneca Falls and uh, voted out this big declaration of women's rights and things, and they talked about the state of New York having been the first to liberate women from marriage slavery. Uh, no, that's not true, and what's more, they knew it wasn't true. They knew that Texas, when they joined the United States the year before, had had community property for women, but they didn't want to give that kind of credit to a slaveholding state, so they deliberately uh, gave that credit to New York, even though New York had debated the very same point that year and voted it down. Uh, so there's a lot of things to do with Judge Hemphill that uh, we can be grateful for. Now the guy on the right, Royal Wheeler, uh, he's kind of controversial uh, because he, he was very um, emphatic in his opinions but he didn't like to argue about them. And he was uh, very much a southerner, very much a supporter of the Civil War. In fact, uh, in 1864, once he realized that the war was lost, uh, left, left Austin, went home, killed himself. But and one thing about Texas jurisprudence of that era that nobody realizes is that Texas, of all the states of the Confederacy, uh, constantly and consistently held the door open for slaves and free African Americans. And when they got their day in court, they usually won. Uh, in fact, there was uh, a lady, Margaret Guest, we talk about this case in the book, um, brought here as a free woman. Uh, and then when her uh, putative owner and paramour died, um, his nephew sued to get the estate, including Margaret and her daughter, which uh, meant that he was actually suing for ownership of his own cousin. Uh, by the way, that was Frank Lubbock, who later became governor. Uh, he lost. She won. Uh, there are repeated cases uh, in antebellum Texas of slaves winning their freedom, uh, suing their masters to get it, even though they had no right to be in court. They constantly held the door open, and Royal Wheeler, uh, uh, card-carrying member of the slaveocracy that he was, uh, wrote some of those decisions. Wrote, in fact, he wrote a, a lot of those decisions. Uh, another thing that makes Texas jurisprudence so unique is there was so much land. I mean, people came out here for land. Uh, when we joined the United States, we're the only state that kept our public domain. And that made for a whole uh, string of cases that we talk about of um, would-be land barons who tried to get even more, or all the uh, different devious ways that people, and I don't, with the Supreme Court here, I don't, I don't need to tell y'all about uh, people who look for those nooks and crannies to try and wiggle their cases into. Uh, so there's a lot of things. Uh, I used to like Charles Goodnight. I've been to his grave. I've been through his house. Uh, he was not a nice man when it came to being acquisitive in matters of land. There was one guy down in Matagorda County uh, during the Republic who, uh, when his neighbor uh, on the neighboring League in Labor went to visit family in the United States, took armed riders onto the guy's ranch, uh, occupied the house, drove off the overseer, and when they came back to find their ranch occupied, made him sign a deed, giving him a thousand acres in consideration for which he can have the rest of the place back. And he went to the Supreme Court of the Republic of Texas expecting to be confirmed in this. Uh, read the book and see what they said. It was pretty colorful stuff. Uh, looking at the guys on the back, uh, I have really come to like some of these guys. Top row, I pointed him out before, Reuben Reed Gaines, second row in the, in the large frame, second from the right. Reuben Reed Gaines became Chief Justice in 1894, famous for, uh, well, he'd been a politician before, but once he joined the court, uh, had nothing to do with politics. He had the most faultless judicial temperament, always the most courteous demeanor. Well, there was that time he chased the waiter out of the Driscoll Hotel with a carving knife, but... Uh, <laughs> Nobody's perfect. Uh, and let's see, bottom row, second from the left, T.J. Brown, Thomas Jefferson Brown. Oh, what a guy he was. Uh, in fact, that was called the consensus court. I think they went 11 years. There were only four cases that were not unanimously decided. Of course, with three, it was much easier back then. 
And what they would do is that uh, when they would meet in conference, uh, Just Justice Gaines would read the decision from below. Now, T.J. Brown was hard of hearing, so Alvin Williams in the bottom right, uh, he would yell into uh, Justice Brown's acousticon hearing aid what it was, that sort of like Garrett Morris from the old Saturday Night Live skit doing <laughs> news for the hearing impaired. And then they would decide if they wanted to hear the case. It's called the consensus court. Now, T.J. Brown there, uh, he's very interesting. He's kind of a uh, fitness buff, you know, and he would take a walk every night, even well into his old age. And when he didn't walk so well, he had a great big tall staff that he would write with, and he liked to walk at night. So he'd hang a lamp uh, from the top of his staff, so he'd go walk. His house was at uh, 14th and San Antonio. So he would go walking up San Antonio Street with his lamp on his staff like Diogenes looking for an honest man. Uh, and But, you know, once he'd start walking, he'd kind of lose away. So, uh, uh, Deputy Clerk Clamp would walk along discreetly behind him and make sure they didn't get flattened by some tin lizzy. Um, he's an interesting guy. He would also, when he walked during the day, he would walk all the way up to what they used to call the insane asylum and chat with some of the patients and then walk his way back. I don't know how that centered him, but it, it seemed to. Uh, there have been times in the history of the court when uh, the members have had to show extraordinary courage. And I wish this picture was in here, but when you leave the room, look straight across at the Court of Criminal Appeals, and the painting immediately to the left of that is uh, James Hall Bell. He was a, the youngest member of the court right at the time of the Civil War, and he was a unionist. And we forget that uh, unionism had a lot of strength in Texas right up until the shooting started. Then you'd get lynched or burnt out if you said the wrong thing. Well, he went home to Brazoria County to vote, uh, the secession uh, referendum, you know, do you really want to secede from the Union? And of course, it was like 46,000 to 14. It was a very lopsided vote. You know why? When he went home to vote in Brazoria, he went up to the polling place. They gave him a card. It was a great big reddish-pink uh, piece of cardboard, and it said, for secession, already printed on it. And a lot of people don't realize that in this uh, uh, referendum, they dispensed with uh, secret balloting. Anyway. Uh, one guy who was there on the scene said, now Justice Bell had, had a very elegant handwriting, and so he uh, put his knee up on a, a chair and braced his knee on the table and asked for a pen. Somebody gave him a pen. He completely marked out for and wrote in against. And the poll watcher said, Judge Bell, I'm really sorry to see you make this decision. You're going to regret it. Think how many people in Texas didn't have the nerve to stand up to that kind of intimidation uh, at the polls. By the way, in Brazoria County, there were only two people who voted against uh, secession, Justice Bell and his brother. Um, I could go on and on and on, but we got to be out of here uh, soon enough. I do hope uh, that when you read this book, you will see um, these factors and these people that, that I just was captivated by. Uh, top row on the left, John William Staten read 40 pages of law every day except Sunday, uh, all his public life. I mean, that's some guy. Even when he wasn't studying a case, you know, he would still um, study law. Now, I do know that um, there is a kind of um, um, feeling out there in the world abroad that history is an academic subject has been taken over by liberals and academics and it's not really written for real people anymore. Well, my answer to that is that when I write a book and I have come to an occasion where I'm going to be signing books at uh, the kind of a reception across the way, I want you to know I have a red pen and I have a blue pen. <laughs> I don't care what your politics are. You know, I will sign it either way you want. <laughs> well, I, I can't tell you how honored I am to have this occasion to actually stand here and talk about court history in front of the Supreme Court. It's something I will remember all my life. Uh, but right now, I'm going to sit down, and I think I'm giving it back to you, am I not? Or I'm giving it to the chief? Thank you. Either way. <laughs> Mr. Harris. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harrison. Fantastic presentation uh, to our author. Uh, the court has asked uh, Paul Green to present a response from the court. 
Uh, Justice Green uh, is uh, a fitting person to present this response. He's our liaison to our task force on preservation of historic court records. Um, his, his family also has uh, a very inspirational history in the legal profession that goes back generations. Justice Paul Green. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, before I begin uh, some of these remarks, I wanted to recognize Joe Jamail and Harry Reasoner and Mrs. Reasoner. Uh, you were mentioned earlier by either Warren or Larry uh, Warren, I think, uh, in, in reference to the contributions, the, the very large contributions you made and to get this book deal off the ground and underway and, and uh, the society and the court thanks you very much uh, for that as well. I also want to mention briefly uh, the, the chief and I are visiting, listening to uh, Jim talking about the, the room and so forth. Of course, the room is very important to the court uh, and, and me particularly. I, I always loved to come into this room and when I came on the court back in uh, 19, I mean, sorry, 2005, um, it became obvious that we needed some extra room uh, in our conference area and so forth. So the Chief Justice asked me to, to do what I could do and try to get some expansion in the room and redecorate the conference room, which hadn't really been touched in a very, very long time, if ever, for that matter. Uh, and so I was sort of inspired by this room. And uh, I asked the uh, state architect to come over with me, to, and I showed him this room. I said, we want to bring something <coughs> from the old court back to the, root, to the new premises at where we are since, well, since 1959. And uh, I invite you to come by and see the conference room uh, when you can, because he really brought some of the essence of this room to that conference room, including uh, the, the, uh, much of the carved wood that you see on the bench, uh, the, the, court, the crown molding and the, the spiral wood, the, the uh, beaded paneling that you see in the room here, very special. Uh, and it's a very unique room. And so it's, it's inspired by this room. Um, this court, like many other institutions in this state, has its traditions. The OEAs that open and close the court, the precise way in which we are seated at the bench, the peculiar way in which the court is addressed, and the black robes we wear, among other things. Thankfully, none of our predecessors carried forward the English tradition of justices wearing white powdered wigs. Not that Justice Hector or I would need one. <laughs> but these traditions of the court that we carefully preserve are an important link to our old English heritage. More than that, they remind us of the sanctity of this place, both as an honored and respected place of civilized dispute resolution, but also as an everlasting shrine to the genius of the founders who established such a remarkable system of justice that is well worth preserving. The history of the courts generally, and of this court particularly, which is of course why we're here today, is also well worth preserving. If one simply wanted to know what the court has done over the years, it can easily be gleaned from the study of the opinions handed down over the years. But obviously this does not tell the whole story of the court. What are, what are the historical context of the court's decisions. There were the formative years of the Republic, the agonizing years of succession and reconstruction, the oil boom, depression, drought, and world war. How did all of these things and more influence the development of the common law in this state? What about the justices? Their backgrounds and personalities most certainly had an influence on the law. Politics, elections, scandal, and deaths all shape the court as we know it today. These are the kinds of things that Mr. Haley writes about in his history of the court. The justices and other court personalities are all brought to life in the context of their times. Here's an example from the book that drew my attention, recounting a court event that happened at the outbreak of World War II. On the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, the justices gathered with their staff in the court conference room which I believe is located somewhere right behind us in, in Representative Duncan's chambers there. They, were, they gathered to listen as President Roosevelt declared war on Japan in his now famous Day That Will Live in Infamy speech. After it was over, all three of the court's briefing attorneys announced they were resigning to join the service, including a young Joe Greenhill. Since most young men were going into the service, 
the court was left with no other choice but to hire female briefing attorneys for the very first time. And to close the historical loop that this story opens, I would note that Joe Greenhill's grandson joined the court this past summer as a law clerk, succeeding his grandfather's distinguished service on the court. And I think Joe is here, is he? He'll stand if he is. There he is. <laughs> otherwise known as Joe Five. <laughs> the court is deeply grateful to the society for the many things it has done over the years in assistance to the court. The board and membership, past and present, have been very generous of their time and resources and have shown unflagging interest in completing this very large and ambitious project. We thank you. And we thank the distinguished author, James Haley, for taking on the daunting task of assembling an unimaginable amount of historical material into a single readable volume. Congratulations to you on a significant achievement. The court is honored by your excellent work. It is certainly the definitive history of the court. In closing, I have to mention an anecdote told to me a couple of years ago. An acquaintance of mine was at an event visiting with Chief Justice Jack Pope when the subject of this book the history of the court came up. Knowing of the Chief Justice's love, both of history and of the court, she asked him if he was writing part of the book. He looked at her with that twinkle in his eye and answered, no ma'am, they're writing about me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, Chief Justice, they were indeed. Mr. Chief Justice, I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> Thank you, Justice Green. And uh, before we close, uh, we wanted to recognize just a few additional special guests, all of whom, by virtue of their public service, uh, have made or are creating history uh, for Texas. Uh, to begin with, I, I was thinking as we were sitting in this room what the relationship must have been like uh, between the court and the legislature since the court was housed uh, within uh, the legislative home, and, and did proximity breed admiration or contempt? I don't know which, which it is, but I can say that uh, the court and the legislature has had a tremendous relationship um, uh, since before my tenure on the court with Chief Justice Phillips and continuing today better than ever. And we have Senator Rodney Ellis in part to thank for that, and Representative Harold Dutton, who was very much our host. We use his uh, office as our roving room, so thank you both. <laughs> and we have former members of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Tom Phillips, Justice Craig Enoch, Justice Priscilla Owen, uh, now on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, and we thank you for uh, being here. Carla Johnson, the wife of Phil Johnson, thank you as well for being here. United States District Judge Lee Yackel, I saw, here. Thank you, Judge Yackel, for being here. Uh, Chief Justice of the Third Court of Appeals, Woody Jones, thank you for being here as well. And I will take a, a page out of Justice Heck's book. If I've missed anyone who thinks they should be recognized, <laughs> Jeff Rose from the Third, <laughs> third Court of Appeals, thank you. And uh, thank you all, guests one and all. Thank you for being here. Uh, that concludes these proceedings. And our clerk of the court will now adjourn the court. All right. Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. The Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas now stands adjourned.